Uh, well, thank you all for uh, coming this evening. Uh, I can promise you you'll get away safely in time for the football. Um, uh, just a few thanks. I, I should give special thanks to people who apparently are watching this through the uh, powers of new technology in Scotland and America and Manchester and uh, Newcastle. For, so thank you for, uh, for joining us. And I just want to give a particular thanks as well as to the RSA team who've coped with me as I've been working on this speech uh, with uh, the people who post on my blog site uh, who are having spent years having a virtual relationship with me. Many of them have been invited tonight. So I, I do hope we get on uh, after. <laughs> um, now, our fantastic uh, colleagues at Cognitive Media have created some slides uh, for me tonight, um, which I hope will... Yes, there they are. Um, now, uh, uh, you'll see that the first um, bit of work is actually an animation, uh, and it's fantastic. Uh, now, actually, we had the whole of my speech done as an animation, but when we did a dress rehearsal, uh, it became far too clear to me that the people watching were so much more interested in the animation uh, than they were in me uh, that because I'm the chief executive, I said that uh, it was probably better for us not to have an animation. So after this initial uh, a piece of work, you'll see just slides. But I think the rest of the animation is going to be available later on when we uh, meet for a chat after the lecture. Actually, the RSA um, Animate series has been a, a massive hit. Uh, I think our most popular lecture has now been viewed uh, nearly one and a half million times. Uh, around the world. So it's been a great way of getting our ideas uh, discussed. Um, and, and attending those lectures, and, and in fact chairing uh, quite a few of them, uh, I've come over the last few months to, to see a, an interesting divide emerging in the speakers that we've had. Uh, on the one hand, uh, there are people like the science writer and self-styled rational uh, optimist Matt Ridley. Uh, now Matt recognizes that the human race has made many mistakes. Uh, particularly in the first half of the 20th century, but he believes that the same tools of exchange and technological innovation uh, that have brought us prosperity, longer, healthier lives, less violence, amazing new experiences and possibilities, um, that those tools won't just solve the problems that we face, like climate change, but will bring us new prosperity and opportunities in the future. In fact, a friend of Matt's, David Eagleman, spoke in this room a few weeks ago, and he has examined the reasons why every single civilization in human history uh, has fallen. Uh, and he, uh, he argues very convincingly uh, that the internet will prevent any future civilization collapsing. So uh, these are uh, the optimists. On the other side, uh, we have people like James Lovelock, who's uh, also spoken in this room, uh, who, who believe that humankind's hubris has already wrought undoable wrongs on the planet, that we have long passed the point uh, where ingenuity can save us, and that we must resign ourselves to a process of adaptation in severely reduced circumstances. Um, or just a few weeks ago, we had the Australian thinker, uh, Clive Hamilton. He argued that optimism itself uh, is a serious obstacle to taking the action uh, that we need. He maintains that blind faith in future technology is a kind of psychological coping mechanism, allowing us to delude ourselves about the scale of current environmental uh, and economic challenges. So, the optimists are pretty happy with Enlightenment values and where they've got us to. Meanwhile, the uh, other group uh, often sound as though they think that possibly Enlightenment values have done more harm than they have done uh, good. And these are the debates that have been raging in this room. Now, coming as I do from a new Labour background, there's only one possible position for me to adopt in this debate, which is to, which is to triangulate. Um, <laughs> that is to say that uh, Enlightenment values the kind that gave rise, indeed, to this very institution are important. But that we need to think again about what, is, about what they have come to mean to us. So uh, the reason I'm making this speech on this topic uh, tonight uh, is that the RSA has a new strapline, and that strapline is 21st century uh, enlightenment. And the original enlightenment uh, in the 18th century was not, of course, a single cohesive movement. It didn't have a simple start uh, and finish. Uh, you'll probably recall the answer given by uh, Jaron Lai when he was asked in 1970 what was the impact of the French Revolution, and he said, it's too early to say. Um, Kant talked about the Enlightenment uh, as humanity emerging into uh, adulthood. So when we think about the core ideals of the Enlightenment, uh, it's not simply a kind of historical process. It's in a way um, we think about how those ideals have shaped modern values, norms, and lifestyles. It's a kind of process of cultural psychotherapy. Uh, we're delving into what has shaped the collective consciousness uh, of modern people. 
Uh, and that enables us to explore critically whether, the, what, whether those values and what they have come to mean to us still work for us and whether they meet the challenges that we now face. And what I want to argue in this lecture is that in critically examining what Enlightenment values have come to mean to us, what we can now bring to bear is um, powerful new insights uh, into human nature, insights that have emerged from a variety of scientific disciplines and social sciences over the last 20 or 30 years. Because Copernicus, Galileo, and Newton helped to lay the ground for the Enlightenment by revealing that the laws of nature not only fail to conform to religious doctrine, but also they fail to conform to intuition. So the Pope might have said the sun went round the earth. It might have felt like the sun went round the earth, but science showed otherwise. And I think that insights into human nature have a similar um, double impact, challenging not just the orthodoxies of modern culture, but also unsettling our intuitive sense of ourself in the world. Now, in his recent book, In Defense of the Enlightenment, the philosopher Zvitan Todorov suggests three ideas were at the core of the Enlightenment project, and I want to focus on those ideas. Uh, autonomy, universalism, and the human end purpose of our acts. In relation to autonomy, the idea that every individual should be able to make their own choices, free from unreasonable religious and political constraint, I'm going to argue that we need to aim for a self-aware form of autonomy, informed by a deeper appreciation of the foundations, the possibilities, and the frailties of human nature. In relation to universalism, the idea that all people are deserving of dignity and share fundamental rights, I want to argue that we should pay more attention to our capacity for empathy, because this is not only the sentiment which, which drives universalism, but it's also a vital competency for us if we want to thrive in an interdependent world. And in relation to the humanist principle, that we should organize the world according to what is best for human beings, I want to encourage us to recognize that the question, what is progress, raises substantive and ethical questions, which we should be more willing to acknowledge, to honor, and to debate. So, there's plenty of scope for argument between optimists and pessimists, but I would argue that there is a kind of general consensus on the key challenges facing national and global society. Uh, how is it that we achieve the benefits of economic growth, particularly necessary in the developing world, and in fact all human civilizations rely on economic growth, while at the same time managing environmental limits? How do we deal with the contrast between powerful global forces, whether that's commerce, crime, conflict, at the same time, uh, only having very weak as yet global civil society and governance institutions. How do we manage risk and shape progress to human ends when science and technology and com commerce are so complex and fast moving, something that we've been considering in the last few days in relation to what's been happening in the Gulf of Mexico? Now, my first RSA annual lecture tried to explore the implications of these challenges for citizens in terms of our attitudes and capabilities. I described what I inelegantly called the social aspiration gap. Um, this is a gap, I said, existed between the kind of future that most people aspire to in a country like this and the kind of future we're going to create relying on the ways in which we currently think and behave. Uh, and I said that gap had three dimensions. First of all, that citizens in the future needed to be more engaged to understand the kinds of difficult dilemmas that their leaders faced, to give their leaders permission to make the right decision for all of us for the long term and to recognize how our own behavior shapes, shapes the choices available to our leaders. Secondly, I argued that citizens need to be more self-sufficient and resourceful, and this, of course, is particularly true in the context of uh, a long period of public sector spending constraint that we're moving into. Whether it's looking after our health, continuing with our education, saving for our retirement, being willing to set up a business, we need to be comfortable with managing our own lives and confident about taking initiative. And then finally, I said that we needed to be more pro-social, behaving in ways which strengthen society, contributing to what David Halpern, who's sitting in the front row, has called the hidden wealth of nations, our capacity for trust, for caring, and for cooperation. So whilst I don't underestimate the ability of human beings to invent and to adapt, in the end, on balance, I do favor the view that we need to live, dif live differently in the 21st century if we're to be resilient and if we are to thrive. And as the architects of the Enlightenment understood, to live differently involves thinking differently. It involves seeing the world and ourselves from a new perspective. 
So let's talk about autonomy. At the heart of the Enlightenment project is a commitment to the autonomy of human beings to create self-authored, valuable lives. Now, of course, throughout the Enlightenment and ever since, debate has raged about the implications of that ideal. One set of issues concerns how individual autonomy can be reconciled with the collective good. Civic Republicans, for example, argue that autonomy can only be realized in a society which also exhibits civic virtue. Yet, by the end of the 20th century, a combination of factors, including particularly the rise and rise of consumer capitalism, had seen the idea of autonomy sequestered by the shrill ideology of possessive individualism. And as I discussed in last year's lecture, this ideology has even been superimposed on our idea of democracy. With the decline of deference and class-based politics, the principle the customer is always right has been imported into the political sphere. But the problem, as I pointed out last year, is that the voter is not always right. Uh, as our leading pollster, Ben Page, has said, the public want something very simple. They want Swedish welfare on American taxes. Another example is that most voters, overwhelmingly voters, say they want more power devolved to the local level, but an equal majority say that public services uh, should be the same uh, everywhere. Um, now, it's not actually that people are uh, stupid or unreasonable. The interesting thing is this, that the preferences that people express in mass polls of individual opinion are different to those which they reach after a process of group deliberation. But when politicians and commentators genuflect to public opinion, it's generally to superficial individual preferences that they refer, not the outcomes of informed collective deliberation. I've made a bit of a, a hobby of mine, actually, studying how reasonable the public can be towards politicians. Um, uh, it all goes back to when I was a county councillor in Warwickshire, um, and we were discussing a school closure. And at the end of the meeting, I was about 24, I think, at the end of the meeting, someone came up to me, and uh, he said to me, I never forget, he said to me, he said to me, it's absolutely disgraceful. And I said, well, what, what, what is? He said, well, what you're wearing? I, I think I wasn't wearing a tie. Um, I wasn't wearing a, a, just a jacket. And um, he said, absolutely outrageous. And I said, look, I'm trying to defend myself. I said, look, I, I'm, 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 just wearing, you know, I'm just wearing ordinary clothes. I'm just an ordinary person. Yes, he said, I'm rather afraid you are. Um, So individualism has been subject to a range of philosophical, sociological, and political critiques. And meanwhile, public opinion and public policy has kind of gone to and fro on a spectrum, the individualist, collectivist spectrum. But, but what I want to argue, of course, is that in recent years, um, the work that I talked about earlier in areas as disparate as economics, evolutionary psychology, and neuroscience have provided new grounds for questioning the way in which we understand autonomy. So for example, most of our behavior, including social interaction, is the result of us responding automatically to the world around us, rather than the outcome of conscious decision-making. And in this sense, it's more realistic to see ourselves as integrally connected to the social and natural world, rather than as a separate, wholly autonomous entity. Uh, the research is clear. If you want to be a happier person, don't read a self-help book. Just have happier friends. And there are other lessons that we can learn from the more subtle and holistic model of human nature now emerging. You know, we're not very good at making long-term decisions. Uh, we're much better at understanding relative than absolute values. And as we found out in the credit crunch, we are enthralled to what Keynes called uh, animal uh, spirits. Perhaps even more startlingly, we are very, very bad at predicting what's going to make us happy. And we're even bad at describing what made us happy in the past. So I would argue that the moral and political critique of individualism now has an evidence base. And it's with this in mind that I argue that 21st century enlightenment should champion a more self-aware, socially embedded model of autonomy that recognizes our frailties and limitations. Now, this does not mean repudiating the rights of the individual, and nor does it underestimate our unique ability to shape our own destinies. Indeed, it's actually by understanding that conscious thought is only a part of what drives our behavior that we become better to, uh, able to exercise self-control. Uh, in my lecture last year, I used a simple metaphor, well, I thought it was simple, uh, for human behavior of an elephant being ridden through a cultivated jungle in which the elephant, there he is, uh, is our conscious, uh, the rider of the elephant is our conscious thought, the elephant is our automatic systems, and the jungle is our social context. The skillful elephant rider is not under the illusion that he can take any route at any speed he likes, uh, but understands the habits of the elephant and the advantages and pitfalls of different paths through the jungle. 
So appreciating that as individuals, we are continuous with the context we occupy, understanding the emotional basis of reason, and acknowledging our cognitive frailties, all of this can enable us to distinguish our needs from our appetites and our amazing human potential from the hubris of individualism. It's the basis for self-aware autonomy. Now, Todorov's second enlightenment principle, universalism, is generally taken to mean that all human beings are born with inalienable rights and equally deserving of dignity. And the question of what these rights should consist has since become one of the defining issues of post-enlightenment political <coughs> discourse. But the question that is less often asked is what is it that drives us to act on the principle of universalism? It's one thing to sign up to the ideal, even in its more minimal versions, but it's another to put it into practice, particularly when this requires us to make sacrifices, or when those whose rights are denied or threatened are distant or different. So I want to argue that of all the attributes which we might seek to nurture in modern citizens, living as they do in the more diverse communities that make up our more interdependent world, the one that matters most is our capacity for empathy. The developmental psychologist Robert Keegan argues that successfully functioning in a society with diverse values, traditions, and lifestyles requires us, in his words, to have a relationship to our own reactions rather than be captive of them. He goes on to write of an ability, and I quote, to resist our tendencies to make right or true that which is merely familiar, and wrong or false that which is only strange. Now, the good news, and it is really good news, is that there's every reason to believe that we can expand empathy's reach. Despite major departures from the trend, most terribly in the 20th century, the history of the human race has been one of diminishing person-to-person -person violence. Since the advent of modern civil rights, we've seen a revolution in social attitudes based on race, and gender, and sexuality. Furthermore, real-time global media have brought the suffering of distant people into our living rooms, and immigration, emigration, and foreign travel all provide us with opportunities to put ourselves in other people's shoes. Not that it's always quite as simple as that. I got a cab the other night uh, with a cab driver who was Nigerian. I was chatting to him, and he turned to me and he said, you know, he said, London is great. There's just one problem, too many Somalians. Um, but there are reasons to ask whether the process of widening human empathy has stalled and at just the time when we need it to accelerate. After four decades of post-war progress, levels of inequality have risen in the rich world. Tensions between different ethnic groups persist and have taken on new dimensions. Anti-immigrant sentiment has grown arguably reflecting a failure by policymakers to balance the imperatives of globalization and the ideal of universalism with the empathic capacity of the communities most, connect, most affected by change. From gangs to the impact of violent video games, there are worries about young people. Globalization and public deficits may mean that future generations in the West face tougher challenges than their parents. And in fact, just this month, a paper to the American Association of Psychological Science aggregated information from studies of 14,000 college students and found a, a growing decline in empathy in comparison to the late 1970s. And on the bigger stage, despite the growing interdependence of the world, the national frame for political interests, but became, which became dominant around the time of the Enlightenment, shows little sign of weakening. A recent RSA speaker was the development economist Paul Collier, and he told uh, his audience that in his view, the institutions of global governance were, if any, are, if anything, weaker than they were 20 years ago. So the stock of global empathy upon which democratic leaders can draw has to grow if we're to reach agreements which put the long-term needs of the whole planet and all its people ahead of short-term national concerns. Now, I think it's reasonable to presume, and indeed there is some evidence to suggest, that those who are most relaxed about outsi outsiders in their midst are also those most inclined to be sympathetic to the plight of strangers far away, or even to the interests of future generations. But the chain linking interpersonal, communal, and global scale empathy is complex. I'd simply argue this, intellectuals, politicians, and interest groups, and think tanks, spend an enormous amount of time debating what should be the content of universalism, which rights, which entitlements, which capabilities. But shouldn't we perhaps just spend a little more time exploring the foundations of universalist sentiment? What is it that enhances and what is it that diminishes our empathic capacity? 
Policy implications range from a continued emphasis on the early years of child rearing to developing schools as intelligent communities to exploring the way popular culture inclines us to think of other people. For example, a culture which prized empathy would be one which distinguished the healthy activity of public disagreement from the unhealthy habit of public disparagement. We are used to, it's become a cliche, uh, that education is the most valuable resource in a global knowledge economy. I would argue that fostering empathic capacity is just as important to achieving a world of citizens at peace with each other and with themselves. But even were we to have more self-aware and more empathic citizens, they would still face dilemmas and differences of opinion. And Todorov's third enlightenment principle is what he calls the human end purpose of our acts. In other words, the basis for social arrangements should be what increases human happiness and welfare, not what's dictated by the words of gods or the whims of kings. But if gods and kings aren't to decide what's right for us, then how are we to make those decisions? Of course, the utilitarian answer lies in maximizing human happiness. And if progress is measured in these terms, we have done well since the Enlightenment. There is little doubt. The poorest citizens of the developed world now have better health, longer lifespans, and many more resources and opportunities than those who would have been considered well off a century ago. But sometimes, Sometimes it feels as though the idea that progress should be designed to increase happiness has turned into the assumption that pursuing progress is the same as improve, improving human welfare. The success of the Western post-enlightenment project has resulted in a society like ours being dominated by three logics. The logic of science and technological progress, the logic of markets, and the logic of bureaucracy. And the limits of the logic of science and of markets lie in their indifference to a substantive concern for the general good. If something can be discovered and developed, it should be discovered and developed. If something can be sold, then it should be sold. And the problem for bureaucracies, as Max Weber pointed out 100 years ago, is a tendency to put the rationality of rules above the rationality of ends. Now, sometimes these three logics of science, of markets, and bureaucracy, they clash. But often, it seems to me, they amplify. And as globalization and the evident power of markets make competition more intense and pervasive, there seems to be, in the private sector, the public sector, the voluntary sector even, one overriding rule, whatever helps the organization successfully to compete is right. And as globalization advances over public spending, the logic of bureaucratic competition will become only more overbearing. And so it's in this context that the 21st century Enlightenment project demands a reassertion of the fundamentally ethical dimension of humanism. How can we make it easier to ask, is this right? Because an incurious or utilitarian approach to human progress leaves us without a framework or even a language through which to inquire more deeply into the kind of future we want. Just take one example. Is it to be a world where so many of us feel that the shape of our lives is dictated not by the ideal of a life fully lived, but by social convention and economic circumstance? Why should we cram education into the first quarter of our lives, desperately balance work and caring in the second and third quarter, and then feel that we're going to suffer second-class status and a fear of neglect in the final quarter. But so powerful are the logics of progress that it can sometimes come as a shock to be reminded that as well as lacking all our modern comforts, citizens of pre-industrial periods also enjoyed many things that we might envy. Shorter working hours, more festivals and parties, stronger community and family bonds, for example. You see, rationality can tell us how best to get from A to Z, but without ethical reasoning, we cannot discuss where Z should be. We know the evidence that the relationship between wealth and well-being amongst the well-off people of well-off countries has become attenuated. Uh, the Danes, apparently, are the most contented people in the world. And not just because they're materially comfortable, because, but because if you ask the Danes what matters most to happiness, they say relationship. The most miserable people are the Bulgarians. Because if you ask the Bulgarians what matters most, they say money. So what we aim for can be as important to our well-being as what we achieve. I can't resist this conversation of uh, um, national characteristics. Uh, and I hope there's no one German in the audience by telling the story of little Hans. Um, little Hans, uh, the story of little Hans is that little Hans was born as a beautiful boy, but he didn't speak. And he grew up. He 
wonderful in every way, but he just didn't speak. His parents tried everything, but he would never speak. And eventually he was nine years old and he was being served his supper and his mother gave him his tea and he turned to his mother and he, says, he said, this strudel is bitter. So uh, his mother thought that she must be making a mistake and said, little Hans, I thought you spoke. And then was, this strudel is bitter. So she's overwhelmed with delight and she goes to get Hans. His father brings him in and say to your father what you said to me, Hans. So this strudel is bitter. So they're embracing each other. They're so delighted. And they turn to Hans and they say, before they phone everybody and, and tell them, they said, but Hans, you know, you're nine years old. We took you to speech therapist. We took doctor. You never spoke. Why, why did you never speak? And Hans says, well, he says, up until now, everything was satisfactory. Um, <laughs> but w one of the peculiarities about the difficulty we have about having substantive and ethical discussions is that there's more and more evidence uh, that we are profoundly ethical beings. In a recent Yale University experiment, babies between 6 and 12 months old, so pre-language, watched a simple colored geometric shape ascend a slope. And when other shapes intervened, apparently either helping or blocking the shape, the children's response showed a clear preference for the helping shape. The evolutionary biologist Mark Hauser has conducted a huge global online survey of moral judgments. And he argues that subtle, but from a modern perspective, idiosyncratic moral distinction appear to be found in all cultures and amongst all human beings. Many share the concerns of secularists about the encroachment of faith into public policy, but while we might want to keep religion out of politics, we need to acknowledge, as the anthropologist Scott Atran has shown, that all of us, religious or not, hold values which are sacred to us. And we also need to recognize that those logics I described before, those logics of progress, are themselves dependent on an often unrecognized ethical framework. Markets rely on trust, bureaucracies on duty, and scientific progress on collaboration. Now, of course, we need the right regulatory frameworks for global commerce and controversial areas of scientific experimentation, but to rely on regulation as a way of ensuring we do the right thing is like trying to turn a clay pot using a rule book. Just as a potter relies on skills and a sense of the aesthetic to shape the spinning clay, so we need business people, public servants, and scientists who've internalized the tenets of ethical practice. And returning to the problem of political engagement, something I feel particularly acutely as I watch the rather dispiriting contest for the Labour leadership. A willingness and an ability to debate substantive and ethical matters is necessary for an authentic and engaging politics. An enlightenment politics, which is about human ends rather than a technocratic politics of regulatory means. Now, the leading contemporary historian of the Enlightenment, Jonathan Israel, who we hope will be speaking here soon, has described the Enlightenment as a revolution of the mind. The changes in our ways of thinking since the 18th century go beyond ideas. It's not only our explicit beliefs that have changed, but our whole way of thinking about ourselves and the world that we occupy. And to many in the Enlightenment, the, project, the aim of the project was not simply to replace one set of beliefs with another set of beliefs. Its champions argued that the nature of the true and the good should not be received wisdom but should emerge through reason and open discussion. And in fact, Kant himself was amongst those who recognized the danger of Enlightenment values becoming their own dogma, forgetting the limited and contingent nature of human rationality. As Michel Foucault says of Kant's own description of the Enlightenment, it has to be conceived as an attitude, an ethos, a philosophical life in which the critique of what we are is at one and the same time the historical analysis of the limits that are imposed on us and an experiment with the possibility of going beyond them. To be responsible, to create a big society, to live sustainably, this is not simply a matter of will. The 21st century enlightenment calls for us to see past simplistic and inadequate ideas of freedom, of justice, and of progress. Perhaps it's time to stop chasing those myths to stop being transfixed by abstractions and instead to reconnect a concrete understanding of who we are as human beings to political debates about who we need to be and philosophical, philosophical and even spiritual exploration, exploration of who we might aspire to be. Now, if all this sounds pious and unrealistic, I would contend that there are already some trends and practices in modern society which appear to align with the principles of 21st century enlightenment a shift in public policy towards the recognition of the vital importance of early years development, the time of attachment when identity and the capacity for empathy 
is most firmly molded. The signs that in developed societies were beginning to take mental health more seriously and developing the same sense of agency about addressing mental as physical well-being. And one of the advantages of this is that it means there will be more psychiatrist jokes. Uh, my favorite being the man who walks into the doctor and says, Doctor, Doctor, I think I'm a moth. And the doctor says, I, I can't help you. I think you need to see a psychiatrist. Why did you come here anyway? And the man says, because your light was on. Um, <laughs> And thirdly, we're seeing more, we are continuing to see in academia more multidisciplinary and cross-pollinating research on human nature. And this further strengthens the chances of developing more holistic understanding uh, of how human beings operate and better models for enhancing human capability. There's the evidence that I hear every day that in the race for talent, corporations are increasingly having to prove to recruits that they are genuinely committed to social responsibility. And the number of young people uh, or people of all ages who are trying to set up what are called social businesses, organizations where the question, is this the right thing to do, is always relevant. Or there's the attention being paid to fostering interfaith dialogue, which is important when you think that by 2050, four-fifths of the world's population will probably be believers, a process which involves identifying unifying themes in ethical frameworks, talking respectfully about difference, and collaborating on humanitarian missions. And even a greater willingness, let's see if it survives the economic situation, but a greater willingness amongst government organizations, as well as many others, to question conventional measures of economic growth in favor of a more inclusive model with greater emphasis on well-being and sustainability. The Enlightenment prompted a more reflective public discourse, the emergence of what Jürgen Habermas calls the public sphere. And just as institutions like the RSA, created that space in the 18th century, so we need new and reformed institutions to create a 21st century public sphere. And each strand of the RSA's work can make its contribution to new ways of thinking. Our lectures and other commission content open up exciting ideas about future challenges and human capabilities. Whether it's our work exploring civic engagement, our competency-based curriculum, our work on the social brain or community networks, all our research projects seek to explore the conditions for closing the social aspiration gap. But most of all, the reimagining of fellowship is itself in pursuit of a new ethic of collaboration. Creative people who want to make a difference have a million and one opportunities and distractions. To engage them means an ethic which is intolerant of negativity, rigid thinking, and self-promotion, and instead keeps people constantly in touch with the words of the anthropologist Margaret Mead. True to the spirit which created the Enlightenment, true to the spirit which moved the founders of the RSA 256 years ago, and true to the spirit of the aspirations of our fellows today. Margaret Mead said simply this, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Thank you.